guy over here. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Derek. I'm a community education coordinator with Boulder Community Health. I'd like to welcome you to this lecture on innovative treatments for atrial fibrillation. Before we begin, I need to make a few announcements. At this time, we would appreciate you if you had silenced or turned off your cell phones um, to avoid interrupting the lecture. After the lecture, please take a few minutes to fill out the yellow evaluation forms uh, that we handed to you at the registration table. We look at these very closely for our future lectures. Finally, I'd like to review the format for tonight. The lecture portion will last about 70 minutes or so. After the lecture, we'll use the remaining time until 8 p.m. to take questions. We'll ask you to line up at the, uh, the, at the microphones on either side of the room, um, and please keep your questions to general questions just so the whole group can benefit from hearing them. Also, since this event is being live streamed on the internet, we'll also be taking a few questions from online viewers as well. So on behalf of Boulder, Boulder Commun Community Health, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's panel of speakers, Dr. Samir Oza, Dr. Srini Iyengar, and Dr. Brian Mahan. All three see patients at Boulder Heart, located on the, on the BCH Foothills campus. Please help me give them a warm welcome. Good evening, everyone. Can everyone hear me in the back? I can speak louder. So tonight's lecture is divided in three portions. I'm going to introduce the concept of atrial fibrillation and talk about how to treat atrial fibrillation. Dr. Iyengar is, talk, is going to focus on mainly stroke prevention for atrial fibrillation. And Dr. Mahan will talk about surgical aspects of treatment of atrial fibrillation. So let's dive in. Atrial fibrillation is an irregular heartbeat where the upper chambers of the heart beat up to 300 times a minute. By itself, it's not dangerous, however, Atrial fibrillation increases a person's risk of stroke, and also if undiagnosed, and if the heart rate is high as a result of atrial fibrillation, the heart muscle can get weak. We're going to pass on this. Uh, let's move to the next slide. It's the most common arrhythmia in the United States. About two to two and a half million patients in the US have atrial fibrillation. By age 65, eight in 100 patients have AFib. And as we mentioned earlier, it increases your risk of stroke by 500% or five times. We like to classify atrial fibrillation as paroxysmal, persistent, or permanent. And uh, we'll refer to this throughout the talk. Paroxysmal atrial fibrillation is something that comes and goes in less than seven days. It stops by itself. Persistent atrial fibrillation can last for more than seven days, but can occasionally stop on its own. And permanent atrial fibrillation is when the doctor and the physician make a decision that we are not going to treat the atrial fibrillation and let the patient be in atrial fibrillation for the rest of their life. What are the risk factors for atrial fibrillation? As we mentioned, age is one of the biggest risk factors. Diabetes. Heart problems like valve disease, high blood pressure, congenital heart disease, prior heart surgery, congestive heart failure. High thyroid levels, hyperthyroidism can lead to atrial fibrillation. COPD, we are seeing a lot of sleep apnea that triggers atrial fibrillation. Excessive alcohol use, smoking, and something that's particularly relevant for Boulder, endurance exercise. 
What are the symptoms of atrial fibrillation? The reason atrial fibrillation is important is because half the patients do not have symptoms. And we find out, unfortunately, in some of them, that they have AFib when they show up to the ER with symptoms of stroke. But as symptoms go, the most common is fatigue or lack of energy. Commonly, patients come to me and say, I must be getting old. Well, if you started feeling old in the last six months, that's not getting old, right? Palpitations, which is fast or slow heartbeat, but by definition, always irregular. Shortness of breath, dizziness, chest discomfort. So let's talk about first how atrial fibrillation causes stroke. Dr. Iyengar is gonna be talking more about this. Blood pools in the heart during atrial fibrillation when the upper chambers are not beating, but they are merely fibrillating. The blood clot from the heart then goes to the brain, interrupts the blood flow to the brain, and causes a stroke. And I'll show that in the cartoon here in a minute. 15 out of 100 strokes in this country are caused by atrial fibrillation, and almost all of them are preventable with the correct treatment. And as you can see, uh, there's a lot of deaths and a lot of expenses related to these strokes. So this cartoon is basically showing uh, how blood pools in the upper chambers of the heart, especially in this part of the left atrium called the left atrial appendage. how the blood clot then goes to the carotid arteries in the brain. And then blocks off the blood supply to that part of the brain leading to a stroke. The second dangerous syndrome that happens with atrial fibrillation is cardiomyopathy, which is just a fancy term for a weak heart muscle. How does that happen? Atrial fibrillation creates a lot of irregular and fast signals in the top of the heart. They get through the center of the heart through a structure called the AV node. The ventricles, or the bottom chamber of the heart, beat fast. And heart is a muscle, the heart gets tired and leads to cardiomyopathy, which is a weak heart muscle. The symptoms of cardiomyopathy are what we refer to as congestive heart failure. Swelling of the legs, shortness of breath, fatigue. So how do you diagnose atrial fibrillation? With varying lengths of monitors is the answer. Oftentimes you go to your doctor's office with symptoms you get an EKG, which is a five second snapshot of time, and everything looks normal. But then we wear, then we put longer term monitors on patients with a Holter monitor for 48 hours or monitors for up to a month. Sometimes we put implantable monitors, which are put in through a small incision in the skin takes about two minutes. The monitors stay in the body for up to three years and give us a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. So let's talk about treatment for atrial fibrillation in the next 10 minutes. There are four pillars of treatment. The most important is to prevent a stroke. So accurate diagnosis of atrial fibrillation by one of the monitors that we talked about and starting patients on some drugs that we are going to talk about here in a minute, the common blood thinners as we call them. The second most important thing in my opinion is risk factor modification. Because a lot of the things that cause atrial fibrillation are reversible through lifestyle. And we'll talk briefly about that. 
rate control, and rhythm control. To prevent stroke, we use Coumadin that all of you probably know about, or some of the newer DOACs as we call them, Pradaxa, Zverto, Eliquis, and then the Watchman procedure that Dr. Iyengar is going to talk about. Or if Watchman is not appropriate, Dr. Mahan can remove that part off the left atrium where clots form and cause a stroke. So it can be removed surgically as well. The drugs used for rate control are usually beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. They come in various flavors. They essentially slow down the electrical connection between the top and the bottom of the heart. Those drugs are not doing anything to maintain normal rhythm. Sometimes patients cannot tolerate those drugs because of low blood pressure and are not candidates for the more detailed ablation that we are going to talk about, in which case we place a pacemaker and ablate the AV node. So essentially, we prevent the electrical signals from the top of the heart from reaching the bottom of the heart. It is usually a treatment of last resort. As we said, pacemakers come in various flavors. There is the traditional pacemaker is about the size slightly bigger than a silver dollar, or a completely implantable pacemaker called a micro, Medtronic micro pacemaker that's about the size of a large vitamin capsule. Here's ablation in action. Basically, the patient is in atrial fibrillation. Here on the left side of the screen, these big spikes are the heartbeats. And as you can see, they are fast and irregular. As ablation is turned on, the pacemaker takes over with a regular heartbeat. So this is an excellent option for patients who cannot tolerate drugs or are not candidates for the more detailed ablation procedure. Let's talk about rhythm control in the next five minutes. DC cardioversion, shocking the heart under anesthesia, is very effective. It is like resetting your computer when it's frozen. Alter, control, delete. Problem is, it only converts the heart rhythm at that point in time. The patient may have a recurrence of atrial fibrillation, and the statistics are that 70% of the patients are going to go back in atrial fibrillation within the year. We use antiarrhythmic drugs which block various sodium and potassium channels in the heart and overall are effective about 40% of the time. This one here, amiodaron, is our most effective drug. However, it has a lot of side effects, including the lung and the liver. The way I look at things is when there are seven different ways of doing something in terms of drugs, it means none of them are perfect. So that's where ablation comes in. It is also not perfect, but better than any of the drugs available on the market. The effectiveness of the ablation depends on the type of atrial fibrillation that a patient has. So remember we talked about paroxysmal, persistent, and permanent atrial fibrillation. If you want to have an ablation, the best time to have an ablation is when you are either paroxysmal, your AFib, is paroxysmal rather, or early persistent, meaning somebody who's been stuck in AFib for less than a year. If it's longer than a year, then the patient needs a combined hybrid procedure with Dr. Mahan and myself, or even a surgical maze procedure that he does. That is the gold standard for atrial fibrillation ablation and has the highest success rates. So ablation comes in two flavors. One is radiofrequency ablation, which is heating up the tissue and killing it. The other one is cryoablation, which is freezing the tissue uh, and destroying the abnormal tissue. So what is ablation? It's where, as the slide says, narrow, flexible tubes are inserted into the heart through the veins in the groin. We use x-rays. We use electrical signals from the heart. We use ultrasound, intracardiac ultrasound, which is a tiny probe 
placed inside the heart. And we use 3D mapping, which is like a GPS system to help us guide the ablation. You hear the terms mapping used. These are all part of the same procedure. Mapping is the part of the procedure before the ablation where you are trying to find the source of the arrhythmia. And we use both conventional and 3D mapping. Conventional mapping looks at electrical signals like this. So I stare at these squiggles all day long. I love looking at them. Uh, and these are helpful in treating heart rhythm issues. So this is not a patient with AFib. This was a young boy who was born with an extra fiber in his heart, which was located right here. And about 30 seconds of ablation cured him. AFib is a little bit more difficult to treat, but still a better option than drugs. As we said, 3D mapping is like a GPS system, uses magnetic and electrical fields. Catheter is moved around in space. Each point is recorded on the map as an electrical and a spatial point. And then we take CT data and integrate that with the map. So you take the 3D map, merge it with the CT data, and then you do ablation around the veins. So this, for everybody's reference, is a view from the back of the heart. These are the four pulmonary veins, two from the left lungs, two from the right lungs. This here is the food pipe, and you do ablation all around the veins, all four veins, and any other areas that may be necessary. Cryoballoon ablation, instead of the spot welding that we do with radiofrequency ablation, just makes that procedure a little bit quicker. So less time spent for the patient on the table, less time spent in the heart, and a shorter procedure, faster recovery. With similar, or in our experience, better success rates than RF ablation. Okay, so this is just a cartoon of that. This is a catheter going inside the pulmonary veins. The balloon catheter going over the mapping catheter, which is recording signals from the heart. That's a cross section of the heart, freezing the front half of the balloon. and creating scar tissue around the veins. So that atrial fibrillation, which arises mostly in that area, cannot involve the rest of the heart and effectively treating atrial fibrillation. So those are all my slides. I told you that I would talk more about prevention. I don't have time. Look at the websites. Uh, I do believe that a lot of AFib that we are seeing in this society can be prevented by lifestyle modifications. Sometimes it's freezing, so you may just have to use that. Yep, you got it. All right, folks, that was great. Hopefully you guys can hear me pretty clearly here. So to put this up in my tie a little bit. So that was a great introduction to atrial fibrillation and really what the pathoetiology and what really causes AFib and you know, realistically how we go about treating it. So we're going to go in a little bit different angle right now. I'm going to be talking about stroke in AFib because, again, as Dr. Oza mentioned, one of the big issues with AFib is not just how you feel with it, but rather what it causes. And stroke is one of the biggest risks of AFib, as you guys have probably seen those commercials when they always talk about people with AFib and why should it be on blood thinners. Well, this is what we're going to be discussing here. So, so we talked about AFib causing palpitations, shortness of breath, but what else does it cause? Stroke. So the left atrial appendage, which is the, in the left atrium, can collect blood, which forms clots that can break free in patients with atrial fib or AF. That's why we play, pay, place patients who have AF on blood thinners if they have an elevated risk of stroke. So that's why when you see those commercials for Eliquis, Pradaxa, Zarelto, it's not that blood thinners take away AFib. They have no they have no mechanism of checking, taking away the AFib. What they do is they take away the risk of the clot development because of the AFib. 
So we know AFib is a growing problem associated with greater morbidity and mortality. So the thing is, higher stroke risk for older patients and those with prior stroke or TIA. The thing with AFib, I'm going to be very honest, and all three of us can attest to this, I can't tell you how many times a patient comes to the emergency room for a stroke alert, and the neurologist gets called, the radiologist gets called, and the monitor shows a normal rhythm. So you don't have to be in permanent AFib to have a stroke. And that's why we talked about that paroxysmal AFib, that you could be in AFib for a while, have a stroke, go to the ER, and be in normal rhythm and have no one uh, really know what happened. And a lot of patients who have strokes, well, we're thinking nowadays, the realistic point is, maybe they did have a cult AFib that was never diagnosed. The strokes are debilitating. So, you know, this is the saying with the interventional cardiologists, you know, if someone has a heart attack, sure, a part of their heart muscle might die, but the patient may look okay. When your piece of your brain dies, chances are you're not going to look very good. Whether it be your lip drooping, your arm not moving, you can see a stroke. You don't always see what a heart attack does. So the fact is, it is the number one cause of adult disability worldwide. And AF-related stroke has 1.5 times higher disability and two times higher mortality. So the guidelines that came out about five years ago had said, well, let's go and devise a risk score for patients. How do you get a risk score? So when patients come to the office and say, I have AFib and I'm not taking that rat poison or I'm not paying for that Eliquis or Xarelto, well, then, they'll, then I'll spit back a number. And they say, where did you come up with that number? Well, here it is. That magic number is based off that, that little acronym there called CHADS VAST score. That's based on the C being congestive heart failure, the H being hypertension, the A being age of age of 75, which is two points, D is for diabetes, S is for a prior history of stroke, which is two points, V is for any vascular disease, as in coronary disease or carotid disease, A without a number is for age over 65, which is one point, and the S is for gender, which is female, which is one point as well. There's some fluid changes that are ongoing with the CHADS VASC, but we are currently, the Medicare guidelines are going by these, this acronym itself. So when your CHADS VASC is zero, we recommend basically going on a full dose aspirin. But if you're one or greater, we kind of hedge because at one, you can see it says aspirin or warfarin. And to be honest, the data is coming out stronger and stronger that if you have a CHADS VAS score of one or greater, you should be on a blood thinner. Even if you don't want to be, chances are the fact is, is that your risk of stroke is not zero and is not negligible. What's the problem with being on a blood thinner? It carries the risk of intracerebral hemorrhage or death. There's no minimizing blood thinners because the biggest issue people come and ask me is, I'm on a blood thinner, what's the biggest risk? Well, bleeding. It's a blood thinner. I mean, that's pretty much what's going to happen because the fact is it makes your body harder to clot. Hence why in stroke, in AFib, it prevents the clot from forming in your heart. The issue here is it doesn't cause you to bleed. What blood thinners do is make it harder for you to stop bleeding. So anytime we may all have uh, some issue in our GI tract, somewhere else in our body where a little micro bleed might occur and your body doesn't even concern itself. But if you're on a blood thinner, that little micro bleed can become a big problem and hence lead to issues that you're seeing here, whether it be in your brain, your gut, or some other body part. So there is validated scoring systems to assess stroke risk. So again, this is what I've mentioned before about that CHADS VAS score. We are looking at percentages that statistically, as your numbers go up, your risk of stroke goes up exponentially. So it's not just a, my score is one, I have a 1%, I have a two, I have a 2%. No, as you see, the curves start going up quite dramatically, the higher the stroke risk. And again, there's another stroke risk category. This is a bleeding score. So this basically gives us the risk of bleeding while on blood thinners. So we use this in conjunction with the CHADS VAS score to say, you know what? The risk of bleeding is extremely high. The risk of stroke is a little bit low, so maybe we shouldn't use a blood thinner versus the opposite scenario. But the fact is, bleeding risk increases over a patient's lifespan. Now, I'll tell you, Dr. Mahan will come up and talk next, but we had plenty of discussions. When I first started training, mechanical valves were placed in the heart quite routinely. If you were in your 30s and your 40s, people would say, I'm going to put a mechanical valve in you. It'll last you your whole life. 
Well, guess what, folks? Nowadays, we see all these patients in their 70s and 80s who've had mechanical valves in, and what do they have? They're all bleeding, and they're all on Coumadin because you have to be on a blood thinner with a mechanical valve. And now we're finding the hard way. The mechanical valve might last you your whole life. The problem is your bleeding risk increases over your lifetime. And the fact is we don't really have a good alternative if you're bleeding and you have a mechanical valve. Hence why the kind of mindset has changed from utilizing that type of device. So you can see here, if your has blood score is increasing by one point, it doesn't go one, two, three, it rather it goes 29, 34, 45, and jumps up to 60% of a 10 year bleeding risk. So the fact is, is that how do we prevent stroke in patients with AFib? The standard for years has been warfarin or Coumadin. The problem with this medication is you have to have a tight control of its levels. So we check something called an INR. That basically is when you get your blood tested for Coumadin levels, that's what we're checking. If you are above three, you have a 44% chance of higher bleeding events. If you're below two, you have a nearly 50% chance of having a thromboembolic event or a stroke. Why? Because if you're less than two, it's not working. If you're above three, it's working too well. So you really have to keep it controlled. And I can't tell you how many patients have come to me and say, I was 1.9, how come I had an event? Because 1.9 isn't two. There you go. It really is that tightly regulated. You really do have to take it very seriously if you're taking this medication. So we know oral anticoagulation is a standard of care. The problem is patients don't really like taking these medications. It's the biggest challenge I think most physicians face with these particular group of medications. People say, you know what, I forgot my dose, I'll just take two, two tomorrow. Will that be good enough? That doesn't work that way, you know? And then we think, okay, well, there's these newer medications that came out, the Xarelto's, the Pradaxos, the Eliquis. Well, the problem with these medications is twofold. Number one, they're not cheap. They're very expensive. And number two, there's not many active reversal agents for these medications that are widely available. So that's another big problem when you take these medications. So a lot of patients have said, you know what? I went five years before anybody told me I had AFib, so why do I need to take this medication now? It's because we can't predict a stroke. And you know what? Once it happens, I can't take it back. That's the hard part of this. It's not like a situation where you're saying, well, when it happens, we'll treat you. You don't want to wait for that stroke to happen. And again, I've had a patient last week who said he was 64 years old, and he goes, I'm going to turn 65 next week, so apparently now I need to be on a blood thinner. I said, listen, I didn't write the guidelines, but I'm going to tell you the statistics don't lie. The older you get, and you, if you have a fib, the more likely you are to have a stroke. And that's just reality, folks. And that is something that you have to keep in mind, despite what people think of taking blood thinning medications. But 30% of patients who take these newer anticoagulations stop taking them at two years. So how do you get people to keep taking these medications? As you see here, there's a study discontinuation rate and the major bleeding rate. So patients still bleed on these medications and they still discontinue these medications, whether it be warfarin or the newer, more expensive medications. So the fact is, is that we know it's a growing problem. AFib is not going away. And the fact is, is that 90% of the clots in AFib, maybe 95% are formed from that left atrial appendage that's in the left atrium. So basically at this point, we know that blood thinners are the standard of care if you have a high risk of stroke or a CHADS VASC of one or greater. But we know people discontinue these medications and we know that the bleeding risk compounds over time. So here, if you could look here, I'm just gonna show you really quickly so you have an idea. Right there, that's a big piece of clot. This, this little sac, that's your appendage. That is a big clot just sitting there waiting to come out. So the fact is, is that when that clot does come out, it's like a tube of toothpaste getting squeezed. It'll just come right out and it'll go to your arm, to your head, to your gut. I've seen AFib clot strokes in multiple parts of the body, so it doesn't always go to the brain. And here I'm gonna show you what we have now to give you an alternative to what we can do with medications here. So this is called the Watchman. And I'm gonna go ahead and play this. So what you see here, and actually, sorry folks, let's make sure this plays so before I start talking here. Minimize the pebble.
because the and this does not happen when I put the procedure in. I'll just tell you right now. Though, to be honest, most patients, you you're would be sedated, so this probably would be realistic. You would probably wouldn't be seeing much. So this is the Watchman procedure. This is the actual size of the device that goes in you, and I'm just kidding, this is not the size of it. Uh, basically, what it looks like, it's a mesh with a lot of steel or nickel titanium uh, arms or legs, as you would call it, that go into the appendage. So I call it a cork on a bottle. It literally is that. You're corking off that appendage and basically we'll show you here in the next couple of slides of how we actually implant this device in. So the trials that have come out with this device have been overwhelmingly positive and this has been one of the most rigorously studied devices in medicine. It's gone over 15 years of hardcore data before it was approved by the FDA. So guys, that is your appendage right there. This is your appendage, and that's a clot that's basically sitting right there. And that appendage, maybe in ancient, ancient times, the appendage may have had uh, some relevance, but you can remove an appendage from the heart and not have any clinical relevance to the rest of the body. So that's why putting an occlusion device in there does not cause any systemic problems. So here, looking at the implant procedure, we go through the femoral vein in the groin, and we travel up through the inferior vena cava into the heart. Once we reach the heart, we then make a crossing across the septum. The patients do not feel this, and that hole will close automatically once we pull the sheet back. We then place our catheter into the appendage, and a pigtail catheter guides us in. Once we do that, we actually put the device in, and as you can see, literally a cork on a bottle. And over the next two months, the device actually gets absorbed by the heart. And that basically, that appendage is now non-functional and not causing any more trouble. And I'll go ahead and X out on this, and we'll go back to our Just to give you a quick recap of Dr. Oza's talk. You guys all got that? Excellent. So basically, as you can see, by the time it took me to run that PowerPoint, I would have had a Watchman in you. So that's how quick it usually takes. It's about 20 minutes, to be honest, to put that Watchman device in. It is usually one night in the hospital, and the next morning you will get that uh, little suture in your groin removed, and you're walking three hours after the procedure. So it's pretty remarkable that we are actually able to do these sort of things. But th the fact is, is that people have always said, well, if it's so good, you know, why did it take so long for it to be approved? Well, we have multiple trials that have basically had to show the durability and long-term effectiveness of the device. And I'll be honest, I was very happy that this was performed by the FDA because let's be honest, we don't want one trial to say this device is great and we should all get it. If anything, multiple trials had to prove that this device had utility to prevent strokes in these patients. Now, you guys remember an important number. There is a great number right there. 72% of people freedom of bleeding over three uh, pharmacotherapy intervals. The 100% number doesn't exist for Watchmen. The fact is the left atrial appendage has about 90 to 95% of all blood clots from AFib, but there's still other parts of the body that AFib, I'm sorry, AFib-related clots can come from. The watchman only takes care of that one major area. So when I tell patients, is this better than a blood thinner? Well, I tell them, blood thinners take care of a systemic process. They take care of every clot in the body, whereas the watchman is one particular area. Hence, the watchman is only indicated for patients who have trouble 
with taking blood thinners. So that's why it's not one of those situations where anybody here in the audience says, well, I'm gonna take my Coumadin and throw it out today, and I'm gonna get one of these. It's not indicated for that. It's indicated for patients who cannot tolerate blood thinning medications. Very important to keep that in mind because I can tell you how many patients in a, per week come in and say, I want that Watchman. I saw that, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but there's a commercial now on TV, on ABC or NBC for Watchmen. And I've had patients come in and say, you know, I want to be like that guy playing with my dog and my grandkid. And uh, I'm like, you can go play the dog and grandkid and still be on Eloquist or Coumadin. You know, it's not going to, it's not going to end your day unless you have a pit bull, I guess. But I'm just kidding. You know, anybody who has pit bulls. But, but the fact is, Watchmen reduced ischemic stroke. What that means is the ischemic stroke is the clot that forms, you know, develops. So we know that the Watchmen can reduce that if it comes from the appendage. The big issue, of course, is, remember, if you have a clot in your carotid artery or your aorta or somewhere else, the device is not going to prevent that. That's why the blood thinners are still very valuable. So when you look at the patient population, who gets this device? The patients who get it are the ones with the elevated CHADS vascor who have AFib, who have a reason to get off blood thinners. Again, now, what are the reasons to get off blood thinners? The obvious ones high fall risks, people who fall a lot, who have broken hips or hit their heads while on blood thinners, those are dangerous situations. People who basically have GI bleeds or any bleeding, nasal bleeds or any type of issues where bleeding has become a problematic source. Third, a more interesting situation, maybe in Boulder we see a lot more of, lifestyle. So if you are someone who is basically a mountain climber or a professional skydiver or paraglider, which I do argue that if you're going to fall from a plane without a parachute, it doesn't matter if you're in a blood thinner or not, it's not going to make a difference. But so be it. If you come to my office and say, this is what I do for a living and it's a high-risk lifestyle, that's a different story. But when I say high-risk lifestyle, there's a difference of high-risk lifestyle and work versus social habits. If you're someone who comes to the office and says, hey, I can't afford those newer medications, but that Coumadin, if I drink you know, a bottle of whiskey a night, it's gonna interact with Coumadin and make my liver enzymes crazy. So I want the Watchmen because I'm not gonna give up drinking. To which I reply, you need to go to AA. <laughs> so the fact is, is that we can put the device in everybody with the lifestyle choice. So I recently performed this procedure on a patient who was an active outdoor farmer, but in his hands, he'd come in repeatedly bleeding from his arms and, his, and literally was in the ER for a massive hematoma. Because he was on a blood thinner, he developed something called compartment syndrome where the blood got under the skin but didn't come out and compressed his nerves. That's a real lifestyle choice, and that's someone who is not giving up farming. That is someone who is basically saying, I'd rather give up the blood thinner and take the chance of a stroke than have this issue. Those are the patients where we look at lifestyle being appropriate. So what if I need both ablation and ligation? What if you say, listen, I have AFib, it drives me crazy, and I can't take the blood thinners. What do I do? Well, you can see myself and Dr. Oza, a combination, but to be realistic, sometimes we need to go beyond us. And that's where Dr. Mahan comes in, because surgical procedures can be performed which can address both issues. Dr. Mahan can do something which is the Cox maze, which is the gold standard ablation, and actually take out your appendage at the same time. Mind you, it is more invasive, but it is curative and is actually the gold standard if anybody should have these procedures. Hence, we have a team that discusses these cases. So not everybody just gets, you saw me today, you get this. You saw him, you get that. We discuss these cases and kind of come to a conclusion of what's the best long-term solution. So again, remember, not every patient is going to be a candidate for every single thing we do personally, but amongst the group, most likely there's going to be a therapeutic solution for you. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Mahan. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'll try to make it a little shorter. Um, so uh, most of you are not going to see me. Uh, it's probably a good thing because I leave big incisions and uh, it's a longer recovery. But for people who are, are not able to get through the modalities that they have, we do have alternatives. And again, we discuss this as a group. This is never made individually. Um, these are the people involved, two surgeons, two electrophysiologists, your invasive cardiologists. They're all involved in a committee meeting that discusses each individual case. This is part of a bigger effort we're making called our atrial fibrillation clinic or arrhythmia clinic. It's a more patient-centered 
approach. Uh, rather than seeing a family doc, seeing a cardiologist, bouncing back to EP, seeing me, we're trying to make it more patient-centered where you come to Boulder Heart. Maybe you see a couple of us at the same time or on the same day. We centralize all your studies. We discuss it as a committee. We come up with recommendations. We have mid-levels or PAs or nurse practitioners who track you, communicate with you. So it's, it's a bigger venture that we've started on. We have the expertise. We have the team. Um, we have everything in place. We have phone numbers, uh, an easier phone tree that's all being rolled out here uh, by the end of the year, I believe. So. Um, they talked a little bit about, about the incidence. I think the number to look at is that if over age um, 40, 25% of us are going to experience AFib at least once. So that's a pretty big number. As we get older, as they mentioned, it becomes more prevalent. Dr. Rosa talked about the medical therapy with medications, drugs. Um, then he talked about catheter ablations, and Dr. Iyengar talked about just controlling the left atrial appendage as part of a procedure. I'm talking about the last category here, surgical. There are basically three things that I have to offer. The very simplest one is the left atrial, uh, let me, so this is a healthy heart, and you can see the sinus node is the upper, just so we have, oh, I'm sorry, we have a frame of reference. This is what we call the sinus node, and the AV node is down here. Normal, healthy, beating heart in a normal rhythm starts with an impulse at the top, travels to the lower impulse, and you can see the sequence of the upper and lower chambers beating synchronously. That's the, that's the goal. That's what we want. And that's what your EKG looks like. It's got a little bump here for the atrium, squiggly line here for the ventricle. Nice and regular. If you march this out, they're all spaced evenly. Atrial fibrillation, if you look at the EKG, which they also showed you, you can see that all these spaces are irregular. So it's, and the baseline has a bunch of squiggles, and that's the atrium. The baseline here is the atrium beating at 300 beats a minute. Only a few of those beats get through. They get through irregularly, and that's atrial fibrillation. And that's what the EKG looks like from that. This is a little bit longer slide, but you can watch it. Here we're in normal heart rhythm. You can see the atria are here, and the ventricles down here. These two chambers are the lower, what we call, and these are the upper chambers. You've got your sinus node initiating the impulse, traveling to the AV node, and you see a nice sequence. The blood travels through and goes through the body. Right and left atria, the upper chambers. Right and left ventricle, the lower chambers. The arrhythmia arith originates in, in the upper chambers. That's what we're treating. You're going to see here in a minute, we'll show what atrial fibrillation looks like, so keep your eye on that. Here we go. So you now see it's quivering, no longer nice and synchronous. Your regular beats down here, just like we saw in the EKG. So I was, uh, about a year ago, I was reading a book and the light started flickering and I couldn't figure out what was going on to check the bulb. I looked down and my little dog had chewed the cable. So that's basically what has happened to your atria, is that you have shorts in your atria. Okay, and what we're going to try to do is re-insulate that so you have no longer shorts. A simplistic way of looking at it, but... So when do we offer surgery for atrial fibrillation? It's a very limited number of people we do. We try to save it for people who are significantly symptomatic, who have failed medical therapy, who have failed ablation or two ablations. Um, they're at risk of stroke, but mostly they're ace they, they have symptoms, and it, it really uh, is impacting the quality of their life. There are basically three situations. Most commonly what I do is the first group. So if you're having an aortic valve replacement or coronary artery bypass grafting, or if you're having a mitral valve repair or an aneurysm resection on the heart, if we're there and you have any history of atrial fibrillation, then we go straight to doing what we call a Cox Maze 4, which is the gold standard for atrial fib surgery. It involves 14 different ablation lines, and all ablation is is killing something, right? So we're going to create little fences so those impulses have to stay where we want them, and we keep the bad ones out. 
So that's the majority of the AFib surgery that is done. We do it during the time of open heart surgery. The second group are people who are quite symptomatic, really want to get something done about it. They've had several ablations. The atrial fib has been there too long to really respond to the ablations. There's only so many lines they can do from inside the heart. So then I do from both chest cavities under general anesthetic, of course, through three little one-inch incisions, we put scopes in. Um, I'll get to it in a minute, I'll show you a picture. Um, I do external, or on the outside of the beating heart, we do um, about nine ablation lines. And then two months later, Dr. Ozer or Dr. Um, Asmarov will come back from inside the heart and do additional touch-up. So that's what we, why we call it a hybrid. It's two different modalities, two different people doing it. We don't do it at the same time. We like to let one set of ablation lines heal and see if they're perfect because you get edema and swelling and, and uh, once that goes away, you may not have a perfect line. So um, it's kind of a way of checking each other. And so that combined approach we do for select patients who are quite symptomatic and, and wish to get out of atrial fibrillation. Uh, this is just another picture of the thrombus. This is the left atrial appendage. It's a little sac that hangs off the heart. And you can see this little dart thing in here. This is the thrombus. That's clot. <clears throat> the third operation that we offer is if that select patient who's been chosen for a watchman who can't take blood thinners um, needs to have the appendage closed, but the watchman doesn't fit. There are certain shapes and sizes of the, of the left atrial appendage where the watchman won't work. Then we come in and we put a big clip on the outside of it. Th this is the clip here. So we're, we clip it at the base of it, and so when you look at it from the inside, it's smooth and it's no longer there. That structure then shrinks and, and scars down and goes away. It effectively does the same thing as a watchman. We save it for people who can't do a watchman. It's more invasive, it's a general anesthetic, it's two little incisions in the left chest. Most people go home the next day. A little more discomfort than, than you would have with a watchman. This is just, uh, I was trying to, to show you uh, what we're trying to do with the Cox maze for. So we're gonna create, you know, you've all seen the kids' mazes, the cornfield mazes where the kid can go down one channel but he can't go down that one and he ends up going where they want you to go at the, to the very end. This is what we do in the back of the heart. We cr all these black lines are va uh, various ablation lines and it prevents the impulse from crossing so it has to go this way, it can't go that way. That's, that's the concept of it. That's where the name came from, from, from a cornfield maze like that. All right? Nothing, nothing fancy or scientific about it. It's called a Cox dash maze for. Cox was a surgeon who developed this. He started uh, experimenting in the late 80s and uh, came up with this procedure. Fourth is the fourth iteration of it. Again, another picture of the back of the heart with, with the various lines that we create. It's not important that you see this, but it's, it, you can conceptualize that that's the cornfield and we're creating various patterns so that the impulses can only get where we want them. More of the same. This is the approach we use for the hybrid. This is the patient's head over here, arms. We put three little portals or three little incisions and we take scopes in and we do it on a beating heart there's no heart-lung machine. It's not like open-heart surgery. And then we flip them over, and we do it on the other side. So we have, to do it, we have to approach it from both sides. That takes about three or four hours. They wake up from anesthesia. They go home the next day, usually, um, often two days, uh, if they have a little drainage that we keep a, tu a tube in the chest. Then two or three months later, um, the electrophysiologist goes in and completes the, study from or the uh, procedure from inside. This is what I see with the scope. It doesn't matter what we're looking at, but here are heart structures. Here we are using little scopes and instruments. More of the same. You can see all the various lesions. And this is a Cox maze for. These are all these, all these lines are the various lines that we burn. Here, up here. So the Cox maze for surgery is the gold standard to compare everything to. Um, the treatment, surgical treatment of AFib was really the, the very first thing to do. The catheter ablations that followed were trying to uh, replicate what we could do surgically, less invasively. 
Um, they've had great success in the early AFibs, not, not as successful in the more permanent AFibs. Uh, it does require a heart-lung machine. We have to stop the heart. We have to open up various chambers to do the procedure. And um, most of these are done with some other heart operation, although we do them by themselves for people who are truly symptomatic, really wish to get off of the drugs to restore normal rhythm. Um, probably 10% of our procedures are done alone this way without other, other heart procedures. This is a curve of the success rate. So you can see that um, at six years, a few will drop off. We never say we cure AFib. We say we, we control it. We kind of kick the can down the road. This is the best control we have for it. Despite doing this procedure, some people over time are going to break through and go back into atrial fibrillation, at which point we just um, can resolve ourselves to medications if necessary. 95% um, uh, you know, five-year success occasionally with antiarrhythmics added to it. Um, we have shown some data in retrospective studies that people who go to heart surgery for bypass surgery or mitral valve surgery or aortic valve surgery, that if they leave the operating room with not having their AFib addressed, their survival is decreased versus people who do. So if you're you know, in the process of being evaluated for heart surgery and you have AFib and your surgeon is not talking to you about a Cox maze 4, not just an ablation, but a Cox maze 4, that's a very specific operation. You need to keep looking. It's a class one indication, which means it should be done if you're an AFib. And uh, that's our team. So. That number will change, but eventually there'll be a single number for you to uh, reach out to Boulder Heart for AFib. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> Questions? So we'll be lining up on either side of the microphones um, and for you to ask any questions you'd like. I just had a couple of questions. Um, you talked about prescription thinners, but I was also wondering if you could elaborate on aspirin. There's been a lot in the news this year on aspirin. And my second question is, as opposed to an elevated heart rate, I seem to be dealing with a lot of what they call Brady at like 48. And that gave me a whole different set of symptoms, it seemed. OK. So is my microphone on? OK. So your first question about uh, prescription blood thinners, aspirin has a minor to no role in uh, treating atrial fibrillation-related strokes, or preventing, I should say, atrial fibrillation-related strokes. So aspirin, the reason is uh, aspirin is very effective in preventing heart attacks because the clots that form there are platelet-rich clots. So there are sticky blood cells that clot together and form what we call white clots. Aspirin works very well for them. With atrial fibrillation, there is stasis or sluggishness of blood flow, and the clots are more of the red clot variety, as we call them. And aspirin doesn't do a very good job in preventing those strokes. So that was your first question. Your second question was, uh, can someone have slow heart rate with atrial fibrillation? And the answer is yes. You can have a slow, normal, or fast heart rate with atrial fibrillation. How your body responds depends on two things. How good is your AV node? And how good is your vagus nerve? The vagus nerve is a nerve that supplies the AV node uh, and other areas of the heart and slows things down. So if you are a highly trained athlete, you can have atrial fibrillation with a very slow heart rate, sometimes slower than your normal heart rate. Uh, 
Uh, two questions, I guess. Um, if a patient, and I saw some slide that had mentioned that 70% of people that had a cardioversion may have to go, well, they'll have to go back into AFib within a year. So if that's happened to a patient uh, and, if, and the cardiologist recommends uh, something like Ticosin, is that going to mean that they're going to do another cardioversion or is the Ticosin treatment going to uh, cure the AFib or slow the heart down? And Correct. I guess, what, what are the options at that point? Correct. So if you've had one cardioversion and recurred, we don't just keep on shocking someone unless there is a specific trigger. So for example, a young college student will come with a fib after binge drinking, a holiday heart syndrome, as we call it. Well, those, we do shock them frequently. Uh, but in someone like you who, or someone like your age who's had atrial fibrillation, shocked once, and now on Ticosin, Ticosin may convert, Ticosin is an antiarrhythmic drug that may convert a small number of patients, but majority of patients are going to require a cardioversion afterwards. With those drugs on board, your chance of staying in, a, in normal rhythm at one year is between 40 to 50%. And those drugs are good at maintaining normal rhythm, not converting you to sinus rhythm. Some of those drugs can be used in what we call a pill-in-pocket approach to convert a patient to sinus rhythm. Ticosin is not one of those drugs. Hi, one of our online viewers has a question. Are hot flashes common for people with AFib? So the question is, are hot flashes common with patients with AFib? To be honest, you could have any type of symptomatic change from an arrhythmia, whether it be a fast heart rate, like SVT, supraventricular tachycardia, AFib, or A flutter, which is like the cousin of AFib. So we do see a fair amount of patients, especially with women who complain of the hot flashes with these types of arrhythmias. But I would like to point out one thing we didn't talk about tonight, which I think everyone should take into account, especially women, is your thyroid. So a lot of times people will come in and say, why is it that I have AFib and where did it come from? Sure, it could come from a number of causes, but thyroid is very important to check. And a lot of times it's not something someone routinely knows that their levels are. So if you know, hey, I've had a history of hypo or hyper, that could be a sign that, hey, maybe this could potentially cause this arrhythmia. And if it does, then obviously treating the thyroid disorder might actually alleviate that arrhythmia as well. So hot flashes and a roundabout answer can definitely be related to this, but also keep in mind, is there other reasons for the hot flashes that might basically cause a constellation of symptoms? So I uh, wanted to know what your experience was in terms of effectivity of the cryoablation versus the radio frequency, either in personal experience or in a broader database. So the question was my personal experience with cryo versus radiofrequency ablation. So the head-to-head -head studies that have been done for cryo versus radiofrequency ablation have shown equivalent results. So success rates have been similar. However, in my experience, there are a few things that are different about cryoablation. One is it is a shorter procedure. Because if you think about doing RF ablation, you go point by point around the vein versus with cryo or any balloon-based technology. You know, there are laser balloons coming out that should be available in the next year or two. There are a lot of companies are make, there are six or seven different balloons being developed for ablation, which tells you that the balloon-based technology is very useful in the initial ablation of atrial fibrillation. So for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, the first stage, the main thing we do for patients is isolate those four pulmonary veins, electrically separate them from the rest of the heart. They are somewhat circular in shape. They are not perfect circles. So any balloon-based technology is going to be a faster <clears throat> treatment option. So it's a shorter procedure 
any shorter procedure would mean lower risk of complications because we spend that much less time in the heart, uh, that much less time under anesthesia. In my personal experience, after radiofrequency ablation, we used to have a lot more what we call left atrial tachycardias, little gaps in the lines through which these circuits can travel. So the number of repeat procedures, especially early on, has been lower with cryo than with RF for me personally. Now as radiofrequency techniques develop, they are looking at ablating with what we call high power short duration uh, or radio frequency circular lesion catheters, those things may change again. Yes, ma'am. I had a stroke uh, six and a half years ago and I was recently in Crested Butte looking at the wildflowers and I was up around 9,000 feet and I guess I blacked out and hit a rock and had to be airlifted to a trauma center in Denver. But uh, I was given um, a reversal on Zeralto. So I'm off it now till they clear me on the 28th. So I never missed one day of Zeralto. So I have no trouble taking the drug. But uh, someone has suggested maybe Eliquist is bleeds less, is, is that your uh, experience? Well, I'll tell you, to be honest, the question is, does Eliquist bleed less than Xarelto? I'm gonna be very honest, they all bleed, they all have the same bleeding risks, as in the Eliquist is twice a day, so it wears off faster uh -huh. than a 24 hour acting Xarelto. But I would be concerned that you are in, you're like a perfect example of patients who have come to me and said, I'm in the middle of nowhere, and luckily someone found me and I was able to get medical help, but oftentimes, you have to look at where you are lifestyle-wise, what are you doing? Even if you are diligent and compliant with your medication, is the risk of being on that medication outweighing your lifestyle that you want to do? So again, I wouldn't switch you from Xarelta to Eliquis necessarily because I don't see any real valid reason for that. I'd be more concerned about you know, assessing what you're doing long-term because if you said you were out there smelling wildflowers, is that correct? Oh, well, I was, we were climbing and climbing hiking with and my it, daughter. Exactly, and you made but it But it was a real trauma. I had to go to three hospitals to get to Denver and three, uh, three ambulances. Nobody could treat a, uh, Zeralto, but... Uh, so I, I, I would seriously consider if, honestly, the Watchman makes sense in your situation, but also potentially even going on something else like Coumadin, if you had to, because the reversal for Coumadin is way more widespread than but any other medications. But I'm a vegetarian, and so you can't eat a lot of those things, right, because of vitamin K and... Right, but those are just, again, those are important points, though, when you're sitting with your physician, your doctor, to talk about, because that does play a part in whether or not you want to take these medications. What about ablation? Would that be, uh, would that be um, a, a simpler than... Uh... So the question is... Ablation, so the general question uh, the lady is asking is, ablation as a way to come off blood thinners. And my answer to that is, ablation should be only done for symptoms, not as a reason to come off blood thinners. Because once your CHADS West score is two or higher, the current recommendations, and I follow them, are to stay on anticoagulation regardless of the results of the ablation. Because remember we said in the beginning, ablation is the best treatment we have to offer you, not a cure for AFib. Yeah, but it seems like even if you go on a watch when you need a blood thinner too, because in case I would have a clot someplace else in my body, is that true? We can't, uh, honestly, like I said, 90 to 95% of blood clots from AFib are caused by the left atrial appendage. So of course, we can't say, there's no way to say 100% of it will be taken care of. But again, it's risk reward. It's the rock in the hard place situation. If you have bleeding issues with being on blood thinners, but you have a high CHADS VAS score, then naturally you have to take the best therapy that's available. Well, I'm never going to 9,000 feet again. <laughs> We're gonna take another question. Yes, uh, I take Eloquest. 
and I need some oral surgery. They want me to go off the Eloquest for a few days. How's that increase my risk? So the question is, how does coming off an anticoagulation increase your risk as for short duration during surgery? Uh, I'll answer that question in two parts. Uh, I've had patients who come off blood thinners for three days and now are in a wheelchair because of a stroke. That is incredibly bad luck, but it does, if you look at it statistically, that can always happen. But the, but the talk about stroke and atrial fibrillation is a long-term talk. I, I tell my patients that two or three days, yes, you have to be incredibly unlucky to have a stroke. Majority of the time, most patients do okay, and your physician will also decide if you need to be bridged or not. So based on your individual risk, sometimes we use shorter acting drugs that wear off in 12 hours. So right to the point of surgery, you can get bridging. Uh, the most commonly used drug for that is something called Lovenox. It's an injection you take. But only a doctor can decide whether bridging should be done or not. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> We have another question from an online viewer. Uh, lifestyle has been mentioned, but are there changes one can make to help AFib or reduce its effects? So questions about lifestyle and AFib. Uh, you know, my first visit with patients with atrial fibrillation, uh, we never discuss everything that we talked about today in those 30 to 45 minutes because inevitably I sit down with them and start talking about lifestyle. So what are the, some of the common things I have seen? And there are some people here who have changed their lifestyle and their AFib has gotten better. Uh, what are some of the things that people do? The biggest thing I see is overuse of alcohol. If you start having atrial fibrillation, it might be worthwhile giving up alcohol altogether or maybe having one drink a week. The second thing is obesity, which, is, which acts on AFib in multiple ways. The first is obesity directly leads to sleep apnea in a large number of patients. Sleep apnea by triggering stress on the heart increases your risk of atrial fibrillation. Lack of exercise and inflammation also increase your risk of atrial fibrillation. Diet plays a big role. Overeating. Uh, we could go on and on. Lack of sleep. I think that's a, that's a huge trigger for atrial fibrillation. Not just for AFib, for mortality. You know, if you're not getting seven hours to eight hours of sleep a night, your risk of dying increases. Forget atrial fibrillation. So getting good sleep, going for a walk, eating less than you think uh, you need to eat. Dr. Iyengar and I talk about intermittent fasting all the time. I think both of us practice it. Uh, there, is, there is a lot of data coming out that more than half of the AFib that happens in the community can be prevented by addressing lifestyle. And from my personal point of view, my patients who have an ablation and simultaneously introduce lifestyle changes, have a better long-term outcome, a lower number of repeat ablations than patients who say, okay, I got my ablation, I'm back to drinking four drinks a day. So lifestyle is probably, along with stroke prevention, probably the most important pillar in treating AFib. And since I don't have time to talk about it, go to my website and look at it. It's my full name, samiroza.com. I write a lot about lifestyle. So, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, could you explain why a person with an artificial heart valve cannot take aliquis or an anticoagulant? Brian, do you want to talk about it? Um, or do you want to? Yeah, right. So, uh, artificial heart valves, why, why they cannot take uh, aliquis or Pradaxa? because studies were done that showed that there were more problems, and we're talking about mechanical heart valves. A bovine heart valve 
I'll let Dr. Mahan talk about it a little bit more, but in the initial period, definitely the only drug that has been studied has been warfarin. So in our institution for the first, let's say someone has AFib and has an artificial heart valve. Though by the time Dr. Mahan gets to them, their AFib is gone. But for the artificial heart valve, we keep them on warfarin for the first three months. And after that, we have a discussion with the patient. And to some degree, it's off-label. Uh, some of our patients do go on DOAX or NOAX after those initial three months. Is that right? Yes, yeah, correct. There's really no contraindication to using the NOAX or the other anticoagulants. Um, and for a tissue valve, a bioprosthesis, or a pig or a cow valve, commonly called, or a human valve that's used, we anticoagulate for three months and then we stop it. Now you're saying that if they have AFib after that still then, um, you know, standard of care probably is still Coumadin, but in reality the other drugs are being used probably more so. You guys know better than I. Absolutely. And just to so make... So there really isn't a reason you can't take those afterward. First three months, the only studies have been done with warfarin. So, you know, we try to stick to the protocols. And just to be very clear, if there is a mechanical heart valve, yeah, then it's absolutely warfarin. No substitute. Yes, sir. Uh, so, Dr. Oza, when I first came to see you about three years ago, you mentioned to me that you thought uh, stress was a contributor to AFib, yes. uh, but that there had not been any large or definitive studies done. Has, has that changed at all? This question is, stress and AFib, are there any studies proving it? I am not aware of any studies, but anecdotally, a lot of my patients have done better as they have worked on stress. There has been a study done on meditation and AFib. It was actually done in Kansas City. Uh, forget the name, I, I wanna say it was a yoga AF trial, but basically patients were divided into groups and patients who post ablation uh, used yoga and meditation did better. So could be a surrogate marker of stress. Yes, sir. You guys are very talented. You're really very educational to all of us in here. Thank the you. question I have is how do you get to you? What is the procedure to be able to find out if you have a, a fib, like to talk to somebody, how do you do it? I realize you have, you know, Boulder Hearts as like a good organization. How do you get to the right person? Well, this is, the question is, if you suspect you have AFib and you need to see the right person, the good news is there's three of us might be on the stage, but we represent a bigger group. Every single member of Boulder Heart is a board certified cardiologist. And atrial fibrillation is not that it's not special to you, but rather to us, we see it all the time. And all the members of the group see it all the time. It's ubiquitous. So the fact is, the biggest issue with people with AFib, number one, is you need an EKG. It's not just an irregular heartbeat because oftentimes patients will come in with their Fitbit watches or their Apple watches and say, I have a fast heart rate or I felt my heartbeat skip last night. Is that AFib? Well, we can only diagnose it if you have that electrocardiogram, which can be done in any of our offices or any of our outpatient settings. So it's not as though you have to see an AFib specialist for that diagnosis. That being said, once the diagnosis is made, Obviously, our partners will make sure that you're then funneled or pushed towards one of our directions if you need further treatment. So the good news is it's not you're seeing three tonight and there's nine that are, don't know about this. Everyone works as a team. And basically, if there are symptoms or issues that drive your AFib, one of us will then end up seeing you. You know, I guess my question is more simpler than that. You've called the number that you have here, and who do you get? You don't get anybody you, that can, you can say, this is my cardiologist. Well, you get a phone person get, in India. Uh, no, I'm just, just kidding. You don't get that. <laughs> How do you deal with that? No, we actually, uh, I think we have addressed it this, this morning. We were actually discussing, we have a pod called an atrial fibrillation pod that we are developing where these phone calls are going to go to a nurse or a medical assistant in the EP pod that will address these phone calls. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, I belong to a bike club where we do like 110 miles a week. And uh, I've also been diagnosed due to different situations 
with AFib. My question is, how do you determine whether you really have this proximal or persistent? And the second part of the question is, can I keep exercising? I, I was under the impression it kept my heart strong. Exercise like everything, everything in moderation. Too much exercise also increases someone's chances of developing AFib. Uh, too much exercise increases inflammation, which may increase AFib. Especially, we're, we're talking about endurance exercise. We're not talking about an hour of exercise a day. How do you know whether you have paroxysmal or persistent AFib? The duration that it lasts. And if you are not able to tell by symptoms, wearing a monitor, for example, for two weeks or a month, and you have episodes that start and stop, last for two hours, three hours, that is paroxysmal. If you're stuck in AFib that entire two weeks, that is persistent. And sometimes just by talking to you, we can tell whether it's paroxysmal or persistent. Uh, can you be a candidate for a cryoballoon ablation if you had an RF ablation 17 years prior? Can you get a cryoballoon ablation if you've had an RF ablation before? The answer is yes. Okay, and I have like three questions that are linked. Go for it. If that's true, can you do a cryoballoon ablation when you do a Watchman procedure? So right now the answer is no, uh, because your insurance will not pay for it. And you will be stuck with the bill. But I think, I think that's where the treatment options will be going in the future. We don't like doing Watchmen and then cryoballoon. I think in the future, as these therapies develop, we will be doing the ablation followed by the Watchmen. Because the Watchmen device, uh, our, our wires, et cetera, can get tangled in the Watchmen device uh, so, but can you do a Watchman device today and then have an AFib ablation six months from then? The answer is probably yes. We'd prefer it be the other way around. Oh. And then finally, uh, what's the oldest patient that you've done a Watchman procedure on? So uh, we've done, I personally have done Watchman patients in their 90s, to be honest. And the reason why is because it's an age as Dr. Mahan likes to say, <laughs> age is irrelevant for a lot of these patients because it's about viability of the patient. So I have patients who are in their 60s who are bedridden who I feel it's unethical to do a procedure on because there's really no really quality of life there to begin with. I have patients in their 90s that are doing the boulder boulder every year and absolutely are determined to keep doing it. And those are the patients that we feel, well, they need to get something to help them continue their active lifestyle. Okay, that's excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. I heard you mention that insurance wouldn't cover that. Does Medicare cover any of the procedures such as ablation? The answer is yes. Thank All you. the above. Uh, many years, several years ago, I was diagnosed with AFib, and uh, Dr. Shaw said, if you have an iPhone, I want you to get this app and I want you to get this device. I found it incredibly convenient and easy and it was very easy and I guess some people don't know when they're in AFib. I felt as though I did know and I would get a reading and then it would be, it says it looks like you may be in AFib and I just emailed it to him, and finally he said, no more emails, you're in AFib, we have to treat you. <laughs> so I wonder why, I mean, you can be, have a halter monitor on for a while, but if you don't have an episode during that time, it doesn't show anything. Whereas this device, it's with you, and you just, you know, hold it in your hand, and but it doesn't seem that I've ever heard anybody else so, recommended. So we recommend it to a lot of our patients. Again, it's a fine line between diagnosing your problem and becoming a cardiac neurotic. <laughs> okay? So we have a lot of cardiac neurotics 
who are recording every heartbeat. Oh. <laughs> and they, my motto, uh, our motto, is that we want you to live with the disease, not for the disease. Okay, so the device she's talking about is called the Cardia device, K-A-R-D-I-A. Uh, and basically it talks to your smartphone and records the tracing when you have symptoms. Because right. that's when an arrhythmia is diagnosed, is when you're having symptoms. Mm -hmm. It's an excellent device. The automatic reads on the device are wrong about half the time. But we can look at it afterwards once you have it recorded on your phone. So it's an excellent tool. Where it doesn't work is for a patient whose episodes only happen at night, for example. That's when we have you wear those monitors or insert monitors under your skin. Uh -huh. Thank you. Yes, um, I was just wondering, did I misunderstand or uh, you said that uh, if you're on blood thinners, like I'm on Prodaxa, if you've been on it over a couple of years, that the um, uh, John, man, now I'm, the watchman isn't, you know, I mean, uh, you wouldn't look at that. It's not a viable. So, so the question is, if you've been on the blood thinner, uh, would you be a candidate for watchman? Is that the question you're asking? Yeah, kind of, yeah. Well, the thing is, if you're on a blood thinner, to be honest, so as an implanter of the Watchman, and as one who puts it in, I'm actually someone who actually trains other physicians to put the Watchman in nationally. And I would tell you, when I go talk to other physicians, they're all jumping out of their shoes to get these devices in. And I tell them, if your patient tolerates a blood thinner, keep them on the blood thinner. Because at the end of the day, there's more harm by putting a device in you, potentially, than keeping you on a blood thinner that you've tolerated. So I often say it's unethical for us to tell you, well, yeah, you can stay on that blood thinner, but you know what, it, you could bleed one day. That's, that's just baiting you to get a procedure, and that's not appropriate. If you're tolerating your blood thinner and you're not having issues with it, there's no reason to switch you to put a device in just to get you off it. Okay. You know, also, um, someone asked earlier about getting off blood thinners for three days. I had uh, a knee replacement surgery, and, you know, they want you off blood thinners for at least five to seven days before that. Otherwise, you can just bleed on the table. So, you know, it's not a big deal. So all of it is a risk-benefit analysis for a given patient. If you've been diagnosed with the leaky heart valve, can you go into AFib? Right. So do you want to talk about it? Yeah, sure. Um, is it your mitral valve you're talking about? Do you know? Don't know. Um, I'm from uh, Boulder Heart diagnosed my sister with a leaky heart valve. Yeah. So an it, ultrasound. You know, there are four valves in the heart. There are three that we mostly deal with as adults. Um, all those, because the valve's leaking, you can think of it as if your piston rings were not fitting well in your motor and the oil's blowing by. The motor's running, but it's getting strained. Um, it's the same with your heart valve. If the, if the valves aren't functioning properly, then the heart becomes less efficient. It compensates by getting bigger and doing certain things. It changes its structure and its form to make up for that. Um, all those put pressure on the upper chambers over time, and it can precipitate atrial fibrillation. In my world, which is a kind of a slice of the pie, because these guys see everybody, I see you know, 5% of the people who come in their office come to see me or, or less. Um, everybody I see has a leaky valve and has AFib, but you know I'm I'm kind of in an isolated box, so uh, very common commonly together. And those are the people we do the combined procedure. We do the valve repair, replacement, and uh, the Cox maze four. All right. I guess that we're going to wrap up the question section and. We want to thank our speakers this evening. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you.